bro. So, Gorgias. That's a platonic dialogue with really four main characters. There's like one other in there. You have Socrates, as usual. You have Gorgias, who's this older, esteemed orator, a guy who teaches people how to speak well and sort of argue in public meetings and actually has a kind of school where you go and you learn how to persuade people. His reputation is one that he'll teach you how to get out of anything, essentially, and how to persuade anybody of any opinion. He was actually a living, breathing human being, as is common in most of Plato's dialogues. And we have actually some examples of oratory that he supposedly penned himself. Polis is a younger guy who is fond of the public life and thinks that being able to persuade your way through public life and politics is important. It's both honorable and it's also for your own good. Callicles is this young upstart. Actually, I read on Wikipedia that he's supposed to be an older rhetorician, yeah. but I don't know. Callicles? Yeah. There's not much known about him. He's not mentioned anywhere else. But yeah, he's described as an older. Well, rhetorician. earlier here, he's this, in part of Gorgias, he's described as younger. I read exactly the opposite. Let's leave it aside whether he's a young guy or an old guy. He doesn't try to make the argument necessarily that arguing well is noble. He makes an argument that's a little more radical, which says going for what's pleasurable is the best kind of life. And that's part of what oratory is being able to argue for what you deserve and get all you can get and satisfy all your pleasures. So Socrates goes about this discussion in his usual way, and he tries to engage Gorgias, and then Gorgias sort of gives up, and he moves on to Polis, and Polis sort of gives up, and he moves on to Callicles. Who gives up himself for a little while. And <laughs> who gives up himself at one point, and Socrates has to argue with himself for a while. Which is remarkably similar to him arguing with another person. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. The underlying themes are, at the beginning, the question of what are you teaching when you teach oratory and rhetoric? There's this theme of teaching and what is teachable. There's this theme of what is just and unjust and what is the best role for a human being. And underlying this, of course, is typical in platonic dialogues is what does it mean to live well? Yeah. And the reason that I gave the question to start, what is the relationship between philosophy and art? Because that is the way that I've heard this spun, you know, that you could use this as the first reading in an aesthetics class, that even though it's about rhetoric in particular, which is not even clear that that's one of the arts, it's very clear as it progresses that he's talking not only about the art of persuasion, what lawyers do specifically, say, but any kind of performance that is just for the enjoyment of people. And he uses examples like flute playing and even pastry baking. Well, not that we consider that necessarily one of the arts, but this is certainly applied to all of poetry. The dichotomy is between philosophy, that is, it's about speaking truth and about getting at the good life and teaching virtue and these other things which are about pleasing people. These people who, if they themselves are already corrupt, then what pleases them is probably going to be something equally corrupt. And if you make it your art to be pleasing people in whatever form, then unless they're already virtuous then you're not going to be giving them what they really need, which is to be made into better people. They need to be given the straight, hard truth. They need to be given things that will make them virtuous. It's not that the good things are not pleasurable. They might not be always, but he's making the argument that pastry baking and flute playing is mere flattery because it appeals only to please for pleasing sake, not please for the sake of the good. Yes. In fact, if people are clear eyed, like there's not a lot in a way that's new in this dialogue over and above the other platonic dialogues that we've done on this podcast. But one of the things besides the treatment of rhetoric, which is the most famous part, I think, but that's really only the first you know, explicitly about rhetoric is only the first like fourth third of the dialogue. Then it gets more generally about virtue. So he puts more straightforwardly in this dialogue than in the Republic or other places that we've read this theory of virtue that people, when they are clear headed, will always seek the good. And it's just that if we are already corrupt, having illusions is in fact a form of corruption, right? Lack of knowledge is, is a form of corruption. Knowledge is good. Having bad knowledge, having a bad self-conception, having improper assessment of what is a really good thing, right? Confusing it with surface level base immediate pleasures, say, is something that will confuse you and thereby make you not pursue the correct direction. But if you were truly enlightened, then you would go the right direction. You'd either be virtuous already, or if you were lacking, then you would move to correct yourself, right? Nobody willingly does something that they think is evil. 
So maybe, yeah, we're jumping around a lot, aren't we? We're getting at what, this is the theme, okay? So now the theme yeah. is stated, unless somebody has something to add to that. I mean, it begins with this question, what is oratory? And this was widely regarded in ancient Greece to be the sort of key to the universe, to success, let's say. Learning how to be a good speaker, persuader, you could get what you want. And I think it's Paulus who's very up on that idea, giving examples of, you know, if a doctor and a orator, you know, an orator could basically make himself seem more competent than a doctor, even though he's not. We begin with this idea, this crucial distinction, as, as you pointed out, Mark, between things that rely on knowledge and that convey truth and things that don't. Socrates starts out with this discussion with Gorgias, and by the time we get to, to the end of that, we get this idea that oratory is a way of seeming to be more competent at any given subject than you actually are. And so you're using speech not to teach people, but to persuade them. And that even if you don't know anything, well, you know, especially because you don't know anything, you'll be more persuasive with people who don't know anything. So that's the first section. And then we get, we really, we get two other sections, right? The one with Paulus and then the one with Callicles. And the Paulus is where we, we get this talk about Socrates makes the controversial claim that it's better to be the victim of injustice than the perpetrator of injustice. And we can get into the discussion of that, which seems completely absurd to Paulus. And the reason why it's relevant is because he's trying to show that oratory is not, in fact, this great power to use oratory to get what you want isn't actually going to be a good thing for you. So that sort of serves that larger argument. And then this third section with Callicles, we get a lot of different things. But ultimately, we end up back at this idea that it's not pleasure that's the criterion of the good, but health. You know, it can be health of the soul, health of the body. So we get this comparison between medicine and gymnastics, or this contrast between that and oratory. But we'll talk about that in more detail. But the idea in the end is that oratory is not an art that you use to make things more organized and better and more healthy or to help human beings be better, but that it's this knack that, you know, as you've pointed out, Mark, is for the sake of giving people pleasure. So that's my summary. What do you think, Seth? Anything to add? From a summary perspective, no. Well, how about from an initial response perspective? It's funny. We've had this conversation before, but since it's been a while since we talked about a platonic dialogue, we famously, in the very first episode we ever did of this podcast, talked about kind of how Socrates is an asshole. And there's always this tension when you don't know Greek and you're not as well versed in a lot of the conceptual and cultural norms that when you're reading through this, you're thinking, are they really going to let that go? Is he really going to get away with saying that? And you keep catching yourself and saying, maybe there's something underneath this that I don't understand that makes that a non-controversial statement. And maybe I've just haven't read a dialogue in a little while, but this one particularly got to me, especially in the section on rhetoric, where I just kept having to pause and say, Really? You're just going to let that thesis stand, Gorgias? Like, really? <laughs> really? It's okay? You're just going to let that go? Socrates makes a number of, I don't want to say outrageous claims, but certainly things that would be disputable in this day and age. And I'll be curious if we get into it to push on Wes and Dylan, who I know know a lot more about this stuff than me, to find out if there is something controversial in what was being said, or if there was something understood that I don't understand about some of the claims he's making and some of the argumentative moves that he makes. Well, can we drill into the text in this first section? Do you have a particular spot that you want us to start on? There's a section where, let's just start with the difference between instruction and persuasion. There's, well, Do you have there's, a line number? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if the Kindle... Did it come with those uh, stuff in his line numbers? Are we all using the same translation, by the way? Because when you say instruction... <laughs> the Kindle version I have is the Jowlett translation. I also have the internet version that you guys used. Cooper, yeah. Okay. Give me a second to cross-reference here. While he's looking, not to be nitpicky, but the couple places I've just looked, Callicles is said to be a young guy. <laughs> Is it Socrates it is, calling him a young guy yes. because he's 45 and Socrates is 50? I'll point to the quote. On 515a, Socrates says, since you are yourself now just beginning to do the city's business and urge me to report, and it goes on. Yeah, I saw that. So, I'm not and sure. in both translations that I read in the beginning commentary, he's referred to as a young guy. <laughs> 
Okay. In the Cooper and in the Nichols that I have. And also in a third translation I looked at. Then Wikipedia lies. That would not be the first time. Where is this? This is 515 what? A. By now, my most excellent fellow. Is that where it's in your translation he calls him young fellow? In Cooper, my most excellent fellow, seeing yourself are now just beginning to be engaged in the business of the city, so... That doesn't mean that he's young. That means he's just started to do that. That doesn't... I understand from a strictly logical point of view, but in <laughs> Greek life, that's what you would have been doing. If you were part okay. of the upper class, you start arguing your pants off early in your life. We do know that this is his house. It's his father's house. Oh, it is. Yes. The crucial thing that happens in this first section is nailing down the definition of oratory. And it, it gets a little worrisome early on because it begins to look like it's going to want to be one of these like tedious definition fests, which luckily it doesn't turn out to be. <laughs> Socrates is known for. But, you know, in the end, we get Gorgias trying to say, first he sings its praises and says it's the source of freedom for humankind and the source of rule over one city and things like that. Ultimately, Socrates will force Gorgias to admit that, well, I don't know if Gorgias really admits it, but this idea that oratory is to, I'm reminded of people saying, oh, I want to be a writer, but then that's such a really vague thing. Like Socrates points out, anyone is really an orator or a speaker or persuader when you think about it. Anyone who has a craft, like making shoes or something, if they're teaching their craft to someone, then they're a persuader. But they actually have knowledge to pass on. Just to say you're an orator without that being anchored and some actual craft is kind of a vague thing. So then Gorgias is forced to say, well, it's this is all about political gatherings or law courts and things like that. And then we get into this question of knowledge. And this is kind of the critical thing in the first section. Whether oratory is something that is going to actually provide people with knowledge. And what kind of craft is an orator a craftsman of? Like, what is an orator knowledgeable of such that they are both good at it and can teach it? Right. Right. And if they're good statesmen, that would mean, for Socrates at least, that they would also have to be knowledgeable about the human soul, because that's just the relationship between the individual citizen and the good of the state. Those are one and the same, or at least very closely related bodies of knowledge. So Gorgias has to claim at first that since the orator is obviously not an expert in shoemaking or these other things or being a doctor, that he must be an expert in statecraft in virtue. Or in the just and the unjust, to put it as it's yes. translated in my... Yeah. Yep. Okay. I don't have a specific textual reference, but we are talking about the same place. So, Wes, before the section on knowledge that you're speaking of, Socrates makes a nifty little move where he says to Gorgias, do you think that knowledge and belief are the same thing? And... Gorgias says, of course not. And Socrates says, well, one good evidence of that is we believe there's true and false belief, but there's no such thing as false knowledge. So there can only be true knowledge. So there, whatever knowledge and belief are, they're two separate things. So yeah, of course. And from that point on, there's this association between the ability to, in, in essence, if you're somebody who does something and you can instruct people in it, then you know it, right? And that there's this association between instruction and knowledge. So let's leave aside the fact that somebody who's good at something isn't always necessarily the best teacher of a thing, right? Because Socrates is assuming that anybody who's an expert shoemaker would be able to instruct somebody else in mm -hmm. the craft, and that's clearly not the case. We know there are plenty of people that can do things that can't explain or instruct. But at that point, he goes into... So the art of persuasion is about belief, not about knowledge, right? Because persuasion is not intended to instruct. It's intended to persuade people to your opinion or to your belief, essentially. And Gorgias says yes. And then that gets into the whole value judgment around belief versus knowledge. And I think there's a legitimate move on Gorgias's part that he didn't take where he could say, well, of course, we're trying to persuade and not instruct. And since we're not trying to instruct, I don't need to know all about a thing. I don't need to be able to explain a thing. All I need is to get the person to whom I'm addressing myself to believe one specific thing. Belief is about, you know, is this right or wrong? Is this true or false? 
some kind of belief. And by whatever argumentation, I get that person to believe what I want them to believe, then that is the art of persuasion. And whether it's a true or false belief is irrelevant. But that's what the craft...